Welcome to the 19th episode of Tokyo Alumni Podcast. Today, our guest did not graduate St. Mary's or Aoba, but he did attend those two international schools, and he eventually earned a GED. He dropped out of St. Mary's with a 1.6 GPA, and later on attained a GED and attended community college to get a second chance at education. He eventually attended and graduated Santa Clara University with a bachelor's in science and informational systems. He has worked as a data engineer at a machine learning startup in San Francisco and as a data analysis at Airbnb Tokyo. He is currently pursuing a master's degree in computer science at the University of Sydney. Welcome to the podcast, Kai. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> ah, please don't be. Uh, it's great having you on. Um, I was about to say our youngest guest, but no, I think our youngest guest was, was a few podcasts ago. Um, today, we're going to talk a lot about education. You've been in Australian schools, Japanese schools, American schools, international schools. Um, mentioned this in the intro. There's a whole story about the 1.6 at GPA, but a legendary GPA. And, <laughs> So we can definitely touch upon that. And then, of course, um, you know, your specialty right now, computer science and how you're sort of a unique character in this field because you started in that field so late. Whereas most people, I believe, in the, especially in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, there are stories about kids starting, you know, CS at age eight or, you know, age 10 in their mm-hmm. prep schools. So that would be an interesting topic to touch upon. So uh, first things first, though, um, you know, your educational journey you mentioned it, um, all my guests write their bios themselves, and you chose to write the 1.6 GPA in the beginnings. I think mm-hmm. that is a big part of who you are today. Can you explain to me, you know, how did you end up at St. Mary's? You know, how did, what situations led towards you leaving St. Mary's? Okay, okay. So I'll, I'll start with the gist and uh, see how, where we want to dig into. Uh, I came from Alba to St. Mary's in sixth grade as an ESL student. And then right off the bat, I didn't do well. <laughs> I remember like first year, um, I couldn't understand what the word homework meant. So I didn't do the homework. <laughs> and then That's a big problem. Uh, yeah. Months, yeah, and then that went unnoticed for about four weeks until mm-hmm. I was behind on quite a lot of homework. Uh, I remember that. Uh, but yeah, um, throughout sixth grade, middle school, high school, I wasn't, a big I wasn't particularly passionate about studying and I remember a typical internal dialogue that I would have is what am I studying for like why do I need to study as silly as it sounds that was uh, (laughs) what I was thinking about what I used to think about Uh, I think I stopped going to school sometime in junior year because my like my GPA was already low enough that trying to graduate or trying to even if i got all a's at that point my gpa could have only been salvaged i would have graduated with like two so when you were at saint mary's did you feel like when it came to you know struggling at school and you know you were saying earlier how you were kind of like having this internal dialogue what what is the point of all this which i think a lot of students Mm -hmm. do go through what could have maybe people around you have done better to support you i think a lot of people did try to help me. Uh, a lot of my friends would ask, but not. I don't think anybody really intervened with the, the, the trajectory that I was set on. But I think I was really, I don't think I appeared as if I could be convinced to change the way I was choosing to spend my time. Uh, Miss Gordon, the middle school counselor, also often would invite me to her office and i think because of the fact that it's an old boy school you couldn't really go to the counselor it it felt i don't know cheating so i even though she invited me i never really went so i don't know if people could have done anything about the way i was back in saint mary's that that's really admirable to hear that you're taking ownership though over your own actions because i always feel a little bit of guilt myself too as an educator when um i i used to teach grade nine and at my school too we every year we'd have about five six students not make it academically and i always wondered what could i have done differently um and i remember some would set tell me you you did what you can do but i would always still feel like 
what what could have I done? But but you felt mm-hmm. like St. Mary's did provide an adequate support system to a certain degree that you sort of take ownership of, of, of your of you leaving St. Mary's. Yeah, I think so in middle school I wasn't failing every single class. Maybe I was like a D average. Mm. And uh even though my middle school history teacher, I remember his name was Mr. McMillan. He would be really passive aggressive about how I didn't do my homework again. His class, I remember, was really fascinating. And that kind of helped me a lot later. Mm. But I don't think so. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but the, the things that people tried to do to help me, it I don't think I let it I don't think I let the others help me. But mm. I think unknowingly, a lot of people did help me mm. through the things that I, especially that history class in middle school. That was very profound. What, what made that teacher special? On the schedule, it was just history, but in, it wasn't about history. It was more about philosophy, I think. Uh, mm. We had started with Renaissance spirit and critical thinking. And he asked us, what is critical thinking? And we also covered about freedom of speech and uh like not even not just the constitution but before that how freedom of speech came to be in the first place and all of that was really fascinating to me because that was even i remember that was the first time i even heard about freedom of speech Mm. and i remember going back home that day and googling if we had freedom of speech in japan (laughs) so we have a student who leaves school with a 1.6 right about a decade ago and then about 10 years later, we have someone now who's graduated from a prestigious university like Santa Clara in a very difficult major, who's now pursuing a master's degree in Australia. So what happened? Like, well, how did this transition occur? And maybe I guess we need to rewind back to, you know, your teenage years. So how did this transition mm-hmm. happen? And what can other students who are maybe struggling themselves learn from your experience? So if I sounded like I dropped out in order to go to community college, that's actually not true. I dropped out because I didn't want to study anymore. But I knew that if I wanted to resume, I could go to community college. But at the time, I hated studying so much that I didn't intend on returning. Um, I did work otherwise, though, like part-time jobs, uh, but on a full-time basis for at least a year and a half after dropping out. During those one and a half years, I experienced like uh, quite a few different types of, types of jobs. But after all that, I realized I hit some invisible ceiling. If I wanted to get any better paying jobs, the only way to get more qualified is having years of experience, which felt weird to me that the only differentiator was the, the length of time in which I had experience, which is, very, which is more common in like, uh, jobs that t- entail, like, cu- doing, entail customer service. I, wanted, I, I realized if I wanted to do anything in life, I can't keep living the way I did, which was just working jobs that didn't require college degrees getting slightly better paying jobs. It just wasn't going to last that long. Was there a moment of inspiration? Like, was there a specific date or, or moment or time when you were like, mm. wow, I, I, I can't keep doing this? Uh, it was over time. But I think indirectly, a lot of people that I met, like the friends that I made through working at clothing stores and whatnot, the, the people that I met were regular uh, Japanese people that never went to international schools and uh, indirectly they would express how how lucky I am to be able to speak both languages, Japanese and English. That applies to everybody at international schools. But that atarimai, that given capability mm-hmm. of being bilingual in some languages is something that these people really wish they could have. And that made me realize how that's kind of the reason why I started to think more seriously about studying. So there's a shift in mind 
And then the next step is you got to get your high school degree. So what what type of paths were were there? Who who led you I towards think, this? Uh, so sorry, another thing. I think the mm. sh- the the shift was that I stopped seeing it, uh, studying as something that uh, was um, not fun. That something that just had to be done, like work, to um, an investment that I choose for mm. the future. It's like choosing what stock you want to buy. So mm-hmm. how, how did you do that? Was that through a, a, the d- domestic Tsushin Kyoiku, you know, digital, um, digital platform in Japan, or was it through an American system? There's, I think there's only one or two GED test centers in Japan, uh, one of which is in Imperial, Hot- Imperial Hotel in Ginza. And how long was that process? Um, I think GED allows you to take separate subjects um as many times as you want mm. so i took uh, a few subjects one day and then a few subjects the next day and i think it took maybe a month to book all the classes that i needed mm. uh, but the rest were not too hard wow oh so so you were able to really go with a speedy schedule to complete the high school diploma part yeah yeah I was a little bit worried that I might not pass, but uh, I don't think it should be a problem. He went to international school. So, so the education did pay off in that sense that you were able to just go in. Yeah, pass those even with my like GPA. That. Yeah. Wow. So you get the GED, and then now you face that issue again of where your classmates have, you know, done the four years at St. Mary's. They've gone mm-hmm. through the standard admissions process. So what was the next step from there? Uh, so the next step was choosing or learning about this community college thing. I knew nothing about community college system. So I, th- I, I can't remember what exactly happened. I think I just Googled the best community colleges in California. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. I think the first few that I found were uh, Santa Barbara City College and Foothill De Anza colleges and i was looking straight strictly into those three and i forgot if i posted on facebook or if i saw a post about foothill college but that's when we uh met yeah on yeah I, I recall that that was our connection our foot foothill connection yeah. do you remember uh how it happened i it's all it's all very <laughs> It was like a long time ago, which I guess it is to a certain degree. It's, it's almost 10 years ago. Um, but yeah, I, I do remember us getting in contact. And I remember thinking, you know, here, here's someone very motivated. And I, I think you actually told me at that time, sort of a very redacted, <laughs> like one minute version of sort of what, what has transpired in your you know, academic career in high school. Hmm. And, but even then, I remember thinking, wow, he, he's very different. It's a very different profile. From <laughs> I, don't remember, I don't remember this. And um, yeah, and then I remember talking to you about why I, I, why I recommend Foothill College. And I still recommend Foothill College. You know, yeah, years. yeah. I mean, I, I still, to this day, to this day, I, I, I strongly recommend them. I, I think the best professors I had were not at UC Berkeley, uh, but were at Foothill College. Yeah. yeah, Foothill was great. Foothill was great. I remember when I, even after talking to you and deciding to go to Foothill College. Um, when I was getting ready to move there, <clears throat> I was still not sure if I could actually go through with this path. Because at that point, almost two years since I left high school, when I left high school, I had already stopped studying <laughs> for mm-hmm. at least a year. So it's been three years of no studying. And I honestly, didn't know if I could pass all the classes in the States. This was also my first time living in the States. So it was even after deciding to go to Fuyo College, actually going there was, it, it almost felt like if I do one thing wrong, it was going to end this second chance. But yeah, so, um, what, so you asked me what I wanted, what I chose to study. Yeah. Um, I think we have to choose a major 
when we apply. So I think I chose business. Um, and I can't even remember why I chose business. I think, um, yeah, I honestly don't remember why I chose business. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of people initially choose majors without, without much thought, you know, put into it. Yeah. And, um, I was similar. I think I, I think I did business too. And, <laughs> I, didn't, and, I, and I don't think I chose business uh, saying it was just like a label that I had to choose. But I think I had already made up my mind in majoring in business. Even though it wasn't a thought out decision, I was firm on it. I don't know why. But I think the thing is, it, it feels like business makes sense because it's such a vague term. Yeah, I feel like everything is business, right? So it's yeah. like, major, <laughs> like, you know, give me the job, right? It's business. Yeah, yeah. So is there a change now at this point? You're in community college. Do you feel that shift you were talking about earlier that education is not as much of this like task and you know, this onerous, you know, um, uh, job that you have to complete as opposed to sort of this investment in yourself. Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, but there is also a little bit of pressure because in computer science, I think compared to, I think there's jobs where the, the, the length of time you have experience translates to or the length of time tr translates to experience and knowledge mm -hmm. but in computer science i think it doesn't necessarily happen and everybody has to continue to learn because the technology is always changing so there is even more pressure now that it's official like i'm officially a masters of computer science student mm -hmm. i feel that i have to compete with a lot more people and it, it, I, I always have this like uh, pressure that I feel like I need to be studying a little bit. When you say computer science is con consistently changing and evolving as a major, um, what, what do you mean exactly? Uh, so honestly, it's, it doesn't change as a major, but the field changes rapidly in that what's being used on in the industry um, today is very different from uh, what was being used uh, 12 months ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the pace of change in which technologies replace each other uh, is um, less predictable and also faster in computer science. So if you stop, to, if you stop learning, it's more like you're being left behind as opposed to taking a pause. Mm. That's really interesting because it's already kind of a young man's game to start with, right? I think I read somewhere at Facebook, I think the average employee now is 29 or 28. So if you're 30, you're old. Right? Facebook, yeah. It's, yeah. It's just such a evolving, fast-paced industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like I have so much to learn. So with this computer science major, at least based on what jobs you've con you've been involved in so far in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley in um, Tokyo, what type of day to day operations um, do you have? My the first tech job that I had out of college was the data engineer at a machine learning startup in the Bay Area, and I can't get in on too much of the details. But what I can say is that uh, on day to day, I did a lot of data analysis and programming, specifically programming to analyze to analyze data. Uh, for public utility companies. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I can talk maybe a little bit more about Airbnb. Uh, when I worked at Airbnb, I was in the Tokyo office and mm -hmm. I was a data analyst intern. And basically what I did was uh, internal consulting. Anybody in Airbnb Tokyo needed any kind of help with data analysis or pulling data or making data, uh, mm -hmm. I was the guy they would go to, um, and I was the, I was basically the only data person, or yeah, the only data person. Among the educational part of your journey, 
right? Whether it be St. Mary's, Alba, Japanese School, Foothill. Are there any points that you would want to highlight specifically? The biggest thing was not, the biggest obstacle that I had to overcome was not necessarily the lack of education. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was much more deeper than that. And I think the biggest obstacle that I had to overcome to get my life together was trying to be confident. Uh, because I think when I was in St. Mary's, I was really, didn't have any confidence because my English was not good. And mm -hmm. I was bullied for not being able to speak English that mm -hmm. well. Not a lot of people come in and stay in St. Mary's. Uh, actually, I don't know. I only know for my year. The biggest issue was that I didn't believe that I could become someone who can take a class in college, walk in and actually learn what the lecturer said and uh, remember <laughs> mm. uh, more than, I don't know, actually putting in the effort. It was more how I saw myself, I think. What and do you I think, think was a turning point? In regards to confidence, um, I think I think that was exposure to new uh, environment because I felt as if if I actually tried in St. Mary's and I didn't do well, it's like um, letting yourself down. It's like I tried to mm -hmm. do well, but what if I get a suboptimal grade? And it's it's a very competitive environment that you're in. So essentially, like a self fulfilling prophecy and. I mean, I think you do touch upon a really interesting point that sometimes you, you just need to change the scenery, right? You're basically saying at a certain point, there's a breaking point where it's no longer about changing yourself within the environment you're in, but it's actually just changing the environment itself. Yeah, I think, I think part of it is also the way I was raised by uh, both Asian and immigrant parents in Japan. <laughs> It was very difficult to, they were very demanding about grades or, I don't know, they weren't very demanding about grades, obviously, but they were very demanding about uh, getting myself together. And it, it almost got to a point where if I didn't try, I, would, I wouldn't know how bad I might be at studying. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, I didn't want to face the fact that mm -hmm. I didn't want to admit that I might not know I might not know as much as my classmates about certain things. Interesting. So so that's why, as you were saying earlier, the the big thing was to, to change that environment. Uh, which yeah, I think I needed to be nobody in a new environment. And that's when you first realized that the the privileged position you were in to sort of mm -hmm. be able to 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 give it a second shot through the GED through community college. Yeah. And then we, we kind of glossed over to the Santa Clara chapter um, mm -hmm. of the educational journey. Yeah. Uh, before Santa Clara, uh, so obviously you've been at various continents, various curriculums. What type of curriculums have you found to be most effective? And have you found any types of curriculum to be not effective? The, you've been public school, private school, oh, Japanese schools, um, American schools. The best uh, education that I received was uh, Foothill College, that's for sure. And what uh, made because, Foothill so great? Because uh, I, I just went through process of elimination where Santa Clara, it's a private school and it's very expensive, but the teacher in each class that you take, uh, there's probably less than 50 classmates. Uh, in your senior wow. year, less than 30 students in your class. And you can actually talk to a professor. Mm. But, is it worth the cost? I'm not sure. But mm. with half the cost, you get the same level of interaction and proximity mm. to lecturers in Foothill College. I thought I would like big universities like University of Sydney, but I also realized a lot of lectures can be super disorganized and I can't even talk to the professor. Um, so now that I've seen both sides, I think Foothill was the best because it's both affordable uh, even for international students, it's not as expensive as going to most schools, most universities. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the, the professors were amazing. I, I do think one difference was that mm -hmm. the reason why the classes were really good was the, the, the way they graded was 
every class graded the same in which they graded on a point based system and you earn points and then it was very clear how many points you needed to get what grade and then mm -hmm. once i got to um, santa clara it was more it was a lot uh, vague in terms mm -hmm. of how to succeed and i think to some extent you had to come more close to the teacher and stuff that's interesting. Yeah, that, to have that clarity of, of what points you need for success. All right. So there's a variety of type of kid in high school, right? There's ath athletes, the kids who sing, et cetera. And of course, there's the kids who excel at school and the kids who really struggle. And it's needless to say, you were part of that last group, right? You struggled in high school, but you've managed to come out with a um, bachelor's in science from Santa Clara. Um, not too long from now, a master's in computer science. So what would be your advice towards someone who is currently struggling in high school? Uh, so if somebody, if there's anybody like who's in, who's in my similar, who's in a similar situation to me, let's say uh, your grade may sub, maybe suboptimal and you're not sure what you want to study. I think the first thing that you need to do or that the, these people should do is reach out to their senpais, reach out to people that are older. I think a lot of people uh, don't realize the value of wisdom of other people uh, and how powerful that might be more than Google search. So talk mm -hmm. to other people and get diverse inputs on um, what, what, what they would do in that kind of situation. But first, uh, I would recommend down the, down the line going to community college mm. just because that was such a good path for me and that even if I were to study anything else, I still think going to that foothill, going to foothill college would have been a good choice regardless of what I had selected as my major. I think I would definitely recommend if there's anybody like my situation to uh, explore not just senpais from like uh, your international school because then it might uh, be uh, over you might all be oversampling from one industry there might there might be a typical industry that one school or your high school graduates go into so I think it's important to get diverse inputs uh, because for example I didn't even know that computer science was a thing until the first semester, first quarter in Foothill College. And I've never seen a single line of code since until then. So, mm -hmm. and whereas a lot of people, whereas other people might see it for the first time in high school or middle school. Um, so I think you just need to be exposed to so many, a lot of things that you didn't know before. Um, and I think another thing is that if you went to international school, you're, um, it's very difficult to, you have this pressure to kind of know what direction you want to go into, that you prematurely decide, like, I'm this type of person, or I'm the kind of person who's into economics. Uh, but that might be based on the ratio or the, the, the number of people around you that choose to study that subject. Mm. Um, but because you know because this is I went to old, old boy school there may be the pressure to for example say oh I'm going to study econ too if others are studying econ mm. so I think it's, def it's, it's, it's important to really consider diverse fields um, and both independent research and asking other people is important um, I think there's a lot of new roles that uh, people that graduated even college 10 years ago might not even heard of these days. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, one of them is uh, user experience design. People that graduated college 10 years ago might not have, might not even know it unless they work with UX designers. Yeah, I, I don't know it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very new, and it's also very rare in Japan. Like many careers that are not, that are rare in one place but not rare in the other places, I think these types of careers are very rare in Japan. 
That's an excellent point that to just reach out, right? And it doesn't matter if it's St. Mary's, ASIJ. I think in that sense too, people always undervalue that uh, family tie, right? Like, yeah. uh, for example, a school like, you know, um, YS is not the biggest school, but someone graduated YS like seven years after me, I'm still kind of like, oh, you know, I knew someone from YS. My roommate was from YS, you know, it was just true. Actually, my roommate was from YS <laughs> from 04. <laughs> so there's always that, you know, connection. That's a great piece of advice, I think. And, I, and I, whenever I have reached out to my senpai, not once has someone ever just said like, no, they're always willing to, to at very least give you their time which for a lot of them, that is worth a lot, but, but they're willing to sacrifice that. Yeah, I think, so, so, so to, to kind of uh, organize my answer, specifically to international student or international school student who might be in my position, I would say reach out to senpais. And to, for, for those that may not be in international schools, my advice is to expose yourself to as many fields and subjects as possible. With the, assumption, with the assumption that you might be proven wrong about subject. That's uh, a great always point. be like always be prepared to be proven wrong about something, whether mm -hmm. it be a subject that you think is boring. I used to think computer science was not something that was for me, specifically in community college. The whole time I was like, <laughs> no, that's not something that I do. I'm not into coding. Yeah. <laughs> and now now you're a computer science <laughs> master. Yeah candidates so, master's uh, candidate yeah <laughs> that's crazy how things change so on that note um at the end i like to have the guest um sort of tell us what is to come in the next few months next few years next few decades it's almost kind of like next a little online decades. uh you know online uh, like diary that. per se uh -huh. <laughs> for right. the future so yeah, if you want to put those thoughts together and just tell us for the next minute or so, what is to come for Kai? So what's to come for me or in my life down the, down the line? Um, well, first, finish my master's degree, hopefully in a master's in computer science from the school that I really want to attend, from a school that I really want to attend. And... Uh, get a job that I'm uh, happy to wake up each day to do the work like I did back in Airbnb. And that's, yeah, that's everything. Awesome. So not nice and simple goals, yeah, yet yeah. important goals. It is, it is important. It's surprising how many people wake up and go to jobs that they don't like. Thank you so much, Kai, for joining us from Australia. Yep. Thanks, Nick. And hopefully our paths will cross again. And I wish you the best of luck with your master's program. Yep, thank you.